Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the uh, Admissions in China webinar. Uh, this is Mackenzie from Open Apply here. And today, uh, Stacy Wang, the Admissions Manager at Beijing City International School, is going to be speaking to us about uh, admissions in China, different admissions trends, and tips and strategies for an effective admissions process. Uh, Stacy, after studying and working in China, South Korea, and Finland, returned to Beijing about seven years ago in 2010. She worked in the International School of Beijing's Communication Office and Admissions Office for about five years. And then in 2015, Stacy joined uh, BCIS's Admissions Department as the Admissions Manager. And uh, she should be able to give you all some good advice today. Uh, so I hope you're ready for that. Um, how the webinar is going to be set up is that uh, Stacy will give her presentation for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. If during the presentation you have any questions, uh, there is a little box on the right side of your, uh, of your webinar that should be there for questions. So you can type in questions for Stacy uh, throughout the presentation. And then at the end, there will be a question and answer session for Stacy to answer those questions. So don't forget, if you have any questions, make sure to type them in the questions box and we'll answer them at the, at the end of the, of the webinar. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Stacy to start the presentation. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining my webinar today. Uh, my name is Stacy Wong, the admissions manager at Beijing City International School. Uh, it's really my great honor to be invited to run OpenPlice first webinar series this year um, and share with you some of my insights on current admissions trend, especially in Beijing, and our strategies and admission practices to work with Chinese local students and families. For the following about 40 minutes, we're going to Oh, excuse me, I can I cannot go to the next page. Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry about the technical problem. Uh, for the following about 40 minutes, we're going to touch base on the development of international schools in China, the admissions trend and demographic changes which we found in Beijing, and how shall we cope with all these changes as admissions professionals in the lens of enrollment management. Um, first of all, who am I? Um, Mackenzie has already given you a, a brief introduction about me, um, but as Katie Rickney Zimmerman, the Director of Admissions and Marketing from Sekong South International School mentioned at the recent uh, Open Apply Conference in Phuket, I'm also one of the so-called accidental admission directors. Uh, I believe that none of us in admissions was educated in college to be an admission professional. We all come from different backgrounds before joining in admissions. For me, I was a Chinese teacher in Seoul, South Korea before returning to Beijing in the spring of 2010. I joined International School of Beijing um, a communications department right after I returned um, and then uh, worked for about three years, transferred internally to admissions uh, department at ISB, at the admissions officer and community liaison until May 2015. Then I started my current position as admissions manager at Beijing City International School to oversee BCS entire enrollment and re-enrollment strategies and process. Uh, we will talk further about the admissions trend later of the webinar today. Um, the time while I started my career at international schools in the year of 2010 was really quite different with the current international school market in 2017. Uh, we have been experiencing significant changes on our application pool, family backgrounds, 
competitor and feeder schools, and enrollment strategies. In October 2016, as one of my PDs, I joined the certificate program in leadership in enrollment management offered by University of Southern California. It is a very informative and inspiring program for me to delve into all the aspects of enrollment management through instructions given by the top enrollment leaders in the field. During this one-year program, I was able to discuss, analyze, and challenge various ideas and more with other admission professionals working in both independent schools and higher education. Um, in the meantime, I also became a mom in early 2017. My son Henry is about nine months old now. Um, becoming a mom really gives me a more realistic parent perspective while working with students and parents on a daily basis. This new role helps me to have more empathy and uh, more easily to put my feet in the parent's shoes in terms of um, thinking on our admission services and process. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the current school I'm working with, Beijing City International School was founded in August 2005, beginning with about 100 students uh, in elementary school. Uh, and for now, our enrollment is a little over 1,000 students from toddler to grade 12. BCAS is a nonprofit co-educational day school providing international education to both expatriate community in Beijing and um, Chinese local students as well. Uh, currently about 60% of our students are local and the rest of our uh, student population are from over um, 30 different countries. Um, BCAS is also authorized by IBO to offer the full IB program um, and BCS is also one of the um, only three international schools in Beijing who can offer the full IB program. Uh, and we're also accredited by CIS and WASC. And these are our two beautiful state-of-art campuses located in Beijing's Central Business District. If you are familiar with Beijing, this is the CBD area. Um, the picture on the left side is our main campus for students from grade one to grade 12. And about one kilometer away is our lead certified early childhood center campus for students aged between two to five. Between the two campuses, we also provide shuttle buses for parents, staff, and students to commute every 15 minutes during the work days. And we also have two admission offices on the two campuses. Uh, with six members in total, three admission officers, two assistants, and, and me, um, which is the smiling face. Our ECC admission officer is also my data person to help me maintain the correctness of our student information and generate related reports. Our secondary school admission officer in the meantime um, is also our assessment coordinator to run both flex and standard SSAT test. Um, before we delve into today's topic, I'd like to use ISC research's definition of, uh, of international school for us to better understand and be clear about what kind of schools we're talking about today. By IC's definition, an international school delivers a curriculum to any combination of preschool, primary, or secondary schools, wholly or partly in English, outside an English-speaking country. And if the school is in a country where English is, is one of the official languages, the school offers an English medium curriculum other than the country's national curriculum, and the school is international in its orientation. So to put the definition into today's context, the international school which we are talking about today is a kind of school with any combination of kindergarten, elementary school, and secondary school providing an English medium curriculum wholly or partially other than the national curriculum in China. 
Um, to talk about the development of international schools, please really bear with me some histor history of international schools in China, which I excerpted from IC's report for BCIS. I'll try to be brief. Since the latter half of the 20th century, the international school market has been transformed from a small group of schools designed for wealthy expats into a modern and more inclusive part of the global educational system, serving students from a much wider range of backgrounds. International schools which opened more than a few decades ago were established primarily to meet the needs of expat communities. The expatriates were mostly employed at foreign embassies or multinational companies. Schools taught the national curriculum of their countries of origin, usually uh, British or American. They were small, had limited resources, and most were not for profit. Most of today's international schools bear little resemblance to those early schools. The nationalities of students, curriculum, approaches to learning, and schools' business models have all changed enormously. The international school sector is no longer a small market satisfying the needs of a very small group. It has become a significant industry. The increasing wealth of Chinese local families coupled with high aspiration uh, for their children's education provides the stimulus for much of the development in the international school market. In China, there are more than three and a half million USD millionaires. Many families have high aspirations for their children. They want the best education for their children, which usually means enrolling them abroad for their schooling or at international schools in China, followed by undergraduate studies at Western universities. The scale of the increase in individual wealth has resulted in a dramatic increase in the number of local families who can afford international school fees, leading to a comparable increase in demand for places at international schools. The rising number of middle to high income local Chinese families has shifted the balance in demand for international school places. A few decades ago, expatriated students occupied about 80% of places, whereas local students now occupy the majority of places. This trend continues to present new opportunities in China, where demand from local families has become the main driver of growth. Currently in China, there are three kinds of international schools, respectively the international school sector attached to a public school, private schools invested by local, and international schools for expats residing in China. Before the 1990s, there were not many international schools yet at that moment in China. Um, from the chart on your screen you can see, since the year of 2000, especially after uh, 2010, the number of international schools increased really significantly. By October 2016, there were 661 international schools in China, respectively 122 international schools for expats, 321 international schools invested by local, and 218 international sectors attached to, a, uh, to the Chinese public schools. Mainly, most of these international schools are located in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangdong area. Um, regarding the academic divisions in this international in in these international schools, currently most of these three kinds of international schools have the high school divisions to meet the needs for students applying for a Western university. In the meantime, we also found the trend that Chinese students tend to look for a boarding program overseas in around grade eight um, and grade nine. So withdrawals for these two grades usually much, much higher uh, compared with other grade levels. Another trend that we see is that, um, as we all know since 2013, 
China has initially uh, liberalized the second childbirth policy and in 2016 started a general liberalization of the second childbirth policy with an increase in the number of newborns. On the other hand, with the rapid economic development in China, the incomes of the people are constantly rising, living standards are constantly improving. Education for children is being given more and more attention and people's expectations for education investment and return are getting higher and higher. Therefore, many families are eager to send their children to kindergarten even earlier and select any better kindergartens and this will definitely promote the future growth of the international kindergarten market in China. Uh, we have been talking about the increase of international schools due to the significant increase of the needs for these schools from local families. Uh, however, we have also been seeing in the recent couple of years the reshuffle of international schools in Beijing, for example. Therefore, in the fierce competition, it is very important to maintain the sustainable development of the school by um, strategic planning, we think, clearly identify your school and uh, focusing on the student and the quality of education. Um, although the market and student demographic has been changing, um, but as an admission professionals, part of our role will still be trying to maintain the balanced enrollment to pursue an optimal enrollment each year and through the lens of enrollment management so to support your school's sustainable development in the long run. We are not able to change the market, but we definitely can adjust our admissions policy, standards, and procedures to adapt to all the changes. At BCIS, we have also experiencing the demographic shifts similar to other international schools in Beijing. In 2008 to 2009 school year, about 87% of our student population were foreign passport holders. The rest, the 13% were local Chinese students. About eight years later, for the past 2016 to 17 school year, you can see about 63% of the students on our two campuses are local Chinese students. This is a, a big change. Another similar change is the number of nationalities, or we can say the diversity of campus. We had in the school year of 2013 to 14, 63 nationalities on our campus. But last year, for the school year of 2016 to 17, our number of nationalities decreased to 38. With the flux of inquiries and applications from Chinese local, significant decrease of applicants from expats. As an international school providing an international program, um, we, we really need to think about how shall we cope with the changes, achieve the enrollment goal, and maintain the school's sustainable development. In 2015, the previous SSATB, Current Enrollment Management Association, conducted a survey to director of admissions of member schools. The top challenges identified were, number one, competition from other international schools in the area. Number two, how you're marketing your school effectively. What are your return of investment for all your, your uh, school activities and uh, strategies? Number three, though the competition has been bigger, but at the director of the missions, the demand for you, from your head of school and the board of trustees is still to meet your enrollment number, of course. Economic decline in the area, number four. For many of our, uh, for example, for many of our exp expatriate families at BCAS, they were either um, relocated to another country or their package or educational benefit for their children's education in Beijing has been shrinking. 
Therefore, the demands on tuition discount and financial support are getting bigger and bigger this years. Then, of course, the economic decline will definitely affect the diversity of our school uh, population, student population. Then, as an international school, providing an international curriculum by using English as the main instructional language, the school must have a limit in enrolling students who will need the language and learning supports. But this will also, in the meantime, affect um, our enrollment numbers, of course. Finally, with the increasing of schools um, in the area, the eligible students for, for your program has been declining. In particular, for the higher grade levels in high school, what shall we do to meet these challenges in the perspective of enrollment management? Um, we just mentioned about effectively marketing the school is a challenge. And we also know that positive word of mouth from current parents is probably the most effective marketing tool at your disposal. Based on the data we collected last year, around 70% of our visiting families are actually introduced by either a current parent of our school or a previous visited families to our school before. But the question is how to create your positive word of mouth marketing. From an admissions perspective, it definitely your admissions process and every steps when your admission staff has interactions with the prospective families. Here, I will walk you through the admissions process and share with you some strategies and practices which might be helpful to you uh, to work with your prospective families and to create a more positive word of mouth marketing. As the first step of the funnel, in recent years, um, I bet you have been experiencing an increase of inquiry and tour requests from local families instead of uh, native English speakers or other non-Chinese language speakers. Besides Chinese and uh, English speakers, another biggest application group will be the uh, students from Korea. Therefore, you might see a recent admission staffing structures in a lot of schools with staff who are bilingual in both English and Chinese, um, and in the meantime, hire a full-time or part-time Korean counselor uh, for their significant number of the Korean applicants. For us at BCAS, we, we do not have a Korean admission officer in our admission office, but we do have a very proactive Korean language teacher at BCS and also our uh, Korean PTA parent representative. Um, they're very proactively joined uh, our interactions with uh, our Korean applicants um, on a daily basis and provide support to us. Inquiry and tours are definitely the first impression you can provide to your prospective families. What I'll suggest is that no matter you're doing an individual tour or uh, group tour settings, the first impression and your actual tour usually begins when the parents in the first time call you or work, work with you to reserve a tour. That's the time actually you give them the first impression or the actual tour starts. What I want to emphasize here is that please look at your inquiry and tour procedures to see if it, if it is customer friendly. Do you have a staff clearly and nicely answer the questions and direct them how to reserve a tour on the website or from your, your school system? Do you have a user-friendly software for parents to easily log in and complete the information? Does your security guard greet your visitors in a nice and professional way while the parents in the first time physically visit your school? Does your admission officer know the visitor's information in advance and to tailor the personalized 
um, tour information based on the information she or he has in the lungs. Does your admission officer provide correct, informative, and expected information to the families? And does your admission officer follow up with their visitors? Will the visitors have other opportunities to be reinvited to your campus on some other occasions? These are actually all accountable to an impressive tour. And of course, your facilities, um, wonderful classroom settings, teachers and students are also equally important. But these little details during the inquiry and tour, per, uh, tour process are quite important for your prospective parents to stick with you after the tour and to complete the online application. I will suggest you to go through your entire process and pretend to be a parent and to see if there's anything you might need to make some changes and be improved. At BCAS, we created tour handbooks to ensure all the steps are identified and all the information are constant. Regarding the local families, we did understand that not everyone are comfortable to use an online system to reserve the tour. So the last thing we want to do is to provide them with a very complicated online system that is also not in their mother language. What we did was internally, we tested our open apply tour reservation function uh, for many times um, before we really able the function to ensure it is not hard to access and complete, and it is not that time consuming for parents to complete the process. Uh, and for the online application form completing process, it is really similar to the first step. We do receive many requests from the parents asking if we can provide them with a paper application form or if we can help them to complete their online application instead. Um, and to understand the needs and better support these families, our admission staff um, had their mock applications for their child or their, even the pet to see if there's any problems uh, when they apply for any grades online. And we also work with Open Apply support team to identify any issues we found and to make sure the online form is user friendly and not hard to use. There is another issue we usually find while working with a lot of the applicant families. Um, after they submit the online application um, and they thought their application was already completed um, and they were expecting us to contact them for the next steps, which will be the assessment or interview process. But actually, uh, which we all know, this is not the case for most of your school's admission process. We will need the family to also submit all the required supporting documents to complete the application. Then based on the document received, we can decide if we are going to invite a student for an assessment or interview. Um, so to avoid this problem or disputes with parents later in the admissions process, I'll suggest you to send a checklist reminder to your applicants which will not only help you get more completed file in the funnel, but also look good by the parents. They'll be quite impressed by your immediate follow-up on their application. Remember that the family might not only apply to your school, but also com comparing the schools during the entire admissions process. Um, your professionalism and efficient following up will help your school stood out from other schools. Uh, required supporting documents um, are various from different schools, uh, but normally for most schools will require a two to three year old reports and one to two uh, teachers rec recommendations. It is easier to review the reports from another alike school, especially from an English medium international school. However, for most of our current applicants, most likely you will see the reports in Chinese from a public school system or in Korean 
from a public Korean system. Usually, the Korean reports will be translated into English and authorized as well. But for the Chinese school reports, how shall we verify? Um, I suggest you to require both the ori original Chinese version and the English translated version to be chopped uh, by the school stamp. Um, still, it is hard to learn from the reports what did the student learn in class, what were the performances, and it is impossible to compare the scores uh, with your scoring system. But at least it is a good recommendation for you to see if the student is doing well in the current school and what might be the reason for transferring to another school with a totally different curriculum. Uh, in the process of reviewing the documents, uh, we also found that in some occasions uh, we did re receive questionable uh, recommendations as well. Um, I can give you an example of this. Um, there was one applicant we had applying grade 8 last year. There's a um, sister which we thought might be the parent secretary contacted us regarding the application and admissions process. We did receive a copy of school reports and two recommendations from the teachers. Uh, but what we found out was that the handwritings on both recommendation forms were definitely came from the same person. So this is really one of our questionable recommendation forms. So what we did is we sent an email to the teacher and would like to ask some further questions, but could not get a response from the teacher. And then later from the conversation with the sister, we found that um, it was not the teacher filled out the recommendation forms, but the student's private tutor did both recommendations, but using two different names and two different email addresses. Um, so what I want to say is um, we really cannot rely on the required documents to make the final admissions decision. The reports and recommendations are only one part of the information we reveal and we will definitely uh, meet and interview the students and families in person and check and see any standardized test result before finalizing the final admissions decision. Assessment and interview, of course, is another um, very critical part of our admissions process. Uh, we use both in-house assessments and also standardized tests as well. For our secondary school level, by using SSAT test for both internal and external students, we benchmarked our own SSAT scores. And SSATP can also provide us with a score comparison report every year for us to check and compare the new students enrolled uh, with the previous enrolled students. For this step, I, um, I really would like to emphasize uh, with you um, the importance of, of both student and parent interview, especially with the local applicants. From the student interview, they very often find that students with high standardized test scores, grade school reports and recommendations cannot really use the language to express their own opinions or just reset the lyrics prepared by parents or a consultant. From the parent interview, I'll say um, not exactly an interview with parents, but a conversation to better understand the family's expectations of your school, their expectations of um, their children, and uh, the family educational philosophy. And this is also the chance for parents to better understand your school, if the curriculum, school's mission and culture also align to what they believe and expect. We do prefer at least um, one of the parents can speak, read and write in English, since we are an English medium school and all the uh, communications between teachers and parents are conducted in English language. Um, based on our previous experiences with parents, we do understand some of the parents themselves came from the Chinese public school system 
and would expect our teachers to treat students in a similar way or give similar attention to students like in the public school, which obviously not the case for us. I suggest you to uh, let the parents understand those information in advance to avoid any unnecessary misunderstandings after the enrollment. Admission decisions will be uh, sent out for us at BCS in around March. Based on your school's respective situation, I'll suggest to review your wait list in May or at least in early June before the um, end of school year uh, and to offer out as many fit students as possible. Especially at this time, you will have a better picture of how your re-enrollment looks like and how many seats you have uh, in each grade level. Uh, to achieve the enrollment goal, you will need to work with your divisional heads and head of school to work together with their members um, and the following admissions decision. Uh, I would also like to quickly touch base on the presents or gifts you might receive from your prospective families, most likely from local families. I usually be very clear and set a very clear baseline for all my admission staff that it is unacceptable to accept any gifts from any parents. Of course, we did have um, families come for an interview and brought us with a cake or, or some drinks. Uh, then we, we will definitely happily thank their kindness on behalf of the whole admissions department and let them know this is really unnecessary. Uh, what I want to say here is that um, you cannot be blind for this issue. And I'm sure the last thing you want to hear is between the parents, they're saying your admissions decision is based on um, the gifts and some other stuff. Um, and I understand a lot of schools providing certain level of financial supports and the scholarship program to students uh, as one of your enrollment management tools. Schools use this fin financial programs to increase the campus diversity, um, attract the top students in, in academics, and bring in students with passion and various interests in af uh, after school activities and competitions, which is really good. Um, Finally, I would also want to mention to you the transition program, which uh, BCS is currently providing to all incoming uh, new students uh, for them to better prepare for the transition they may face in a new school environment. The program is two weeks long and taught by uh, BCS teachers uh, on our campus, usually in late July until um, uh, the school starts. Um, with your, your main new students uh, recently come from uh, a different school system, um, it is a really great experience for students, especially the local students, to have the time to feel quite settled in the new school environment, make some new friends, and um, I, I do think you should consider, you should also consider the transition program uh, as part of your school's retention strategy. Uh, which is because um, that a great startup and transition will definitely decrease the dissatisfaction from the new families and increase the possibility to retain the family in the long run. Um, so this is what I, I, I want to share with you today. Um, thank you very much for staying um, until the, the end of the presentation. Um, I, I hope you find it is a little helpful to your work and uh, you can take a little bit of something away uh, from my webinar today. Um, so I'm going to um, hand back to Mackenzie for um, a quick Q&A session. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you so much, Stacey. Uh, I think that was a really interesting presentation and hopefully uh, everyone did learn quite a bit there. I think there were some things that I learned as well. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, as Stacey said, we're gonna do a little Q&A session right now. So if you do have a question, 
um, please go ahead and write it in the questions area and we'll uh, ask it directly to Stacy. Um, I'll get started with just a couple of questions. Um, uh, Stacy said in the beginning that um, in grade eight and nine, a lot of Chinese students will transfer, will want to transfer out and go to a boarding school, maybe overseas um, or somewhere else not in China. Um, so is there any strategies you have for trying to get students to stay and not transfer out? Or do you have specific strategies for then getting a lot of new uh, applicants in for the high school program since a lot of your students might be transferring out? Uh, thank you, Mackenzie. Um, this is a really good question. And actually, um, for this year at BCAS, we, um, since we see the trend of um, many of our grade eight and grade nine students um, are withdrawing um, because they're, they're looking at a um, uh, boarding program um, most of the time in United States or Canada. Um, and uh, the, uh, when we see the attrition uh, from the last year compared with other grade levels, it's really significantly high compared with other, other grades. So what we, we want to do, we're planning right now to start our retention committee, our retention program to try to retain some of the grade eight and grade nine students. So we're, we're planning right now for a retention program to see if at BCAS, if there's anything we can do to meet the needs of the students so they do not need to uh, leave their country or leave their parents to, to study in another country. But in the meantime, we're also trying to see if we can uh, attract or recruit uh, more students applying to these two grade levels. Uh, for example, we're, we're, we're joining uh, the school fairs, especially targeted students applying for uh, grade eight and grade nine uh, and for high school. And in the meantime, um, I think PCS is really, really fortunate since we have uh, really many applications received uh, for, uh, especially from the local, local Chinese students. But what we, we really want to do is we, we, we want to balance our students' enrollment. We want to enroll as many mission fit students as possible instead of to really fit the seats, get the number. Mm -hmm. So the last thing we want to do is we, um, um, we want to achieve the enrollment goal, but we, we enroll the students which is not mission fit. And the next year we have more withdrawals from, from middle and high school, and it's really affect our, uh, the, the school system, uh, sustainability of development. Mm -hmm. So this is what, what we're planning to do and what we have been doing currently. Uh, I have a, another question here uh, from Annie in Shanghai. Um, she's wondering, what information are you collecting to differentiate between the Chinese background families? Like, do you collect any special information from them that you wouldn't collect from expats? And is there a s specific way that you collect it from them compared to expat families? Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Annie, for your question. Uh, actually, we do not really uh, differentiate um, the our our inquiry form um, for um, the Chinese local students or Chinese local families and uh, expat families. What we do is um, uh, when the parents reserve a, a tour on our um, uh, website through open apply tour reservation function, we have an inquiry form for them to fill in. And we ask their, um, their basic information of the students, the grade levels, if they have siblings, how did they get to know BCAS, uh, and what they want to, to, to learn um, from, from, from our school during the tour. Uh, and when they arrive, uh, our admission officers will collect some more information. But the difference for the, for the uh, Chinese visitors and ex expat visitors is that we run the group tours for uh, a maximum of five families together uh, for the group tours, which will conduct it in Chinese language. Uh, but for expats, since we do not have as many as 
um, the visitors request from the expat families. We usually do the individual tours conducted in English for the for the expat families, which we we can we can really personalize the tour based on the student information. For the group tours, since we it's, it's not a, a like an open house with many many families coming on board, uh, maximum we we only have five, sometimes three to five families. So before the tour, our admission officers will also check the inquiry form to try to understand um, uh, the student and family backgrounds. Um, uh, where are they come from? With some of the local fam, although they are Chinese, but actually they relocate from from foreign countries, come back to Beijing, and there are some also really local families. The the information were provided, and the um, the the personalized or individualized the tour will be a little bit different uh, uh, based on the the needs and interests of the school. So it's basically, this is what we we have been doing at BCAS. Uh, thanks, Stacy. Uh, another question here uh, from Jessica. And actually, since you're just talking about the tours, I think this is a good follow-up question. Um, Jessica is wondering uh, what content you have in the tour book that you were talking about before. Um, for our tours, it's usually about one hour to one and a half hours. Uh, based on uh, how many families we have and how many questions we're going to receive from the families. During the one hour tour, the first session will be a, a parent information session. So basically, our admission officer will sit together with our families to introduce uh, the information, the curriculum, uh, as a matter of fact, of our school, the school hours, the timetables, the student population, all this matter of fact to uh, the families. And later, after the, the, the information session, um, our admission officer will lead the families together to uh, an actual tour, visual tour, to, um, um, to showcase our, our facilities. Um, and uh, uh, most of the time, the parents will have a chance to go into the classroom, uh, go to the gym, labs, uh, to actually see what is the classroom looks like, uh, maybe having interaction with the students, uh, and also probably asking questions uh, to the teachers as well. So after the, the actual tour, they will all go back to our conference room where we, we run the information session and to, to, to ask them for the questions. And we're also talking about the um, admissions process, how they apply. Um, usually the parents will, will, will go back if they want to apply, so they'll use um, uh, their own uh, computer to apply online. But if the parents want to apply right after the tour, our admission officer can also support the applying process. Um, in the meantime, we, uh, uh, all our admission officers will share with the parents their uh, email address. So if the parents have any further questions, they can contact their, their, their admission officers for that division application. Um, and for us at BCAS, admissions department, we uh, created uh, our own divisional tour handbook uh, for admission officers to use. So basically, we um, have all the information about pair information session um, to, to be um, written and proofread by our uh, IB coordinators, our principals, and all the people involved with, with all this information. And also, we, we, we write down the tour tracks. So for our, our admission officer also to, to refer to. So this is what we do. We really want our information to be correct, informative, and updated. And in the meantime, uh, we can all give uh, a very consistent information to all the tours we, we have. Thank you. Great. Um, the next question is from Wesley. And he says that the transition camp is a great idea. And he's wondering, what does a day at the camp look like? So what the day of the camp? Like, what's what a typical a day at the camp? At the transition camp? At the transition camp. Um, usually it's a two-week, it's a two-week uh, transition program. 
uh, all in for the newly enrolled BCIS students, no matter your local or, or your, your expatriate or relocated to Beijing. Um, so all the new students um, are need to join the, uh, the transition camp. The purpose is help the students to, um, to, to have a better transition, to get to know the new learning environment, to make, make friends uh, before they actually start the first day of school. Uh, usually the, the camp uh, will start in, in the late July. Uh, um, and then um, after two weeks will be probably the first day of school. They'll start right after the camp for their first day of school. What, act, what activities do they do um, during the, the camp? Um, usually, um, you know, during the, during the camp, um, the instructors or the teachers are all BCS teachers on BCS campus. So the settings will be really uh, uh, classroom settings and uh, the teachers will really carefully design the, the curriculum and the program for the students to really uh, get some experiences on the IB program. So we are an inquiry-based curriculum, research-based curriculum, curriculum for, the, for, for this uh, aspect that so the students can really go into that concept and maybe go to some field trips, uh, and some, have some other activities with the teachers. So all the instructions will be English. This is really helpful for some local Chinese students who really did not have that experiences. So after two weeks, uh, they will have a little bit more experiences with how the, how the uh, learning environment looks like, what the difference with uh, their pre previous learning approaches and their teachers approach teaching approaches in their previous school. So, uh, so we, we really want the students to feel comfortable and really settled when the school starts. Um, and the next question is from uh, Dilong. Uh, Dilong is wondering if you could talk just briefly about uh, how you're using OpenApply at the school, kind of what functions you're using. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Delone, for your for your question about Open Apply. Uh, we have been using Open Apply for around three years um, since the 2014 to 2015 school year, um, and uh, still we are in the learning process of Open Apply, and we really find um, um, it, it, uh, the system really help us to re um, uh, to reduce some of our workload and uh, to uh, to make us really be efficient uh, at our work. Um, regarding the functions we have been using on Open Apply, for example, we we have been using Open Apply's uh, tour reservation function to reserve all the tours, group tours and individual tours, um, and we also use a lot of our um, uh, tag functions. Um, if you're familiar with Open Apply, you'll know there is a tag function which you can tag um, the students um, based on your needs. For example, we're, we're using tag function to um, uh, categorize our students, uh, like uh, the students is an ELL student, so, um, so we'll tag probably ELL uh, beginner, ELL intermediate, ELL advanced, and there's some other categories of the students. When we want to filter out the students, we can easily uh, you know, use the tag filter function, then we can know how many this kind of students we have and that kind of students we have. We also use OpenApply to, um, to communicate with uh, the entire admissions committee. Uh, so um, our admission officer will, will, will leave notes on OpenApply under the specific student profile and then for an, another um, uh, member from the mission committee want to uh, check the student profile, then they can, they can easily see what is the situation of students uh, and uh, what uh, were the communications between uh, admissions and that student or parents. And we also use the, uh, the function of um, um, uh, checklist reminder a lot. Um, when we receive an online application from the family, we'll, this is really easy, you can all in, you need all in to click um, that button and then uh, uh, a list of, um, of, of your checklist is going to 
uh, sent to the parents, which, which is also personalized uh, email to the to the family's email inbox. And we use uh, we all the parents they they use the the up, upload document function as well. So. Um, and if a parent sends an email for us, attached the documents, we'll also help them to upload the documents. So all the docu documents will, will be online. It's easier for any members of uh, our admission committee uh, to, uh, to check the, the documents of a student. Um, of course, we use Open Apply to, to send all the admission decisions. We have the uh, really uh, uh, personalized attached uh, letters. It's really easy. You just uh, click the button, change the status, uh, uh, attached email uh, will be sent to the to the family. Um, uh, what else we're using? Yeah, um, and and of course, it's, we're still in the in the process of learning. We're learning about some new functions of Open Play and keep on uh, uh, improving of our 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 system. Thanks, Stacy. Um, I think we have time for one more question, really quick. Um, so this one is from Jackie, and she wanted to go back to the transition camp, and she was wondering which department leads the programs. Is it the teachers and the principals in charge of it, or is it admissions or a different one? Yep. Uh, thank you very much for your question about the transition camp. Actually, we uh, hire a, a program coordinator. It's no matter a, a teacher from secondary school division or elementary school division. So the teacher who has the enthusiasm and who want to dedicate uh, and contribute their time um, for the camp during the, uh, the summer vacation, then they can apply for the job. So the, the program coordinator actually lead the program and for other departments like admissions, uh, facilities, finance, um, and uh, the teachers, they all um, facilitate and uh, work together, cooperate with the program coordinator for the program. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Stacey. Um, I think we're about out of time today. Um, so thank you all for your questions. I know there were a couple that didn't get answered, but I think uh, Stacey can follow up on uh, you know, a little later uh, to answer those questions. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone tomorrow with a link to the recording of the webinar as well as a copy of the slides. And we'll also include Stacy's contact information. So if anyone does have any further questions that they wanted to ask Stacy, you'll be able to contact her by email as well. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. I just wanted to remind you all that our next webinar is on November 23rd. And that's going to be going over admissions for startups or admissions for smaller schools and how to kind of grow enrollment numbers during that situation. And that'll be led by Heidi Al from Our Planet International School. So if you want to find out more information, uh, feel free to go to events.openapply.com to learn more. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. And thanks again to Stacy for leading the presentation today. Have a great day.